good to see some familiar well, if anyone else is like yes can you smoking inside <laughs> but better not be a joint young man <laughs> um cool well we'll get started if anyone's like i can just add them in um so i'm really stoked to have mark on tonight thank you for joining us uh, Mark's pretty much Mark and Ramon, and are pretty much responsible for like our Color Castle music getting better over the years. We've got a little group chat where there's been feedback going back and forward, and I don't I think without your advice, I, we, our production wouldn't be where it is. So um, it's really good to have you on here and be able to share some more of that knowledge with um, some more people. But for anyone who might not know you or, or, or know about you, did you want to give us a little bit more information and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> just want to say thanks as well for having us, Christian. It's good to be here. Um, and yeah, we've gotten a whole lot of value out of uh, throwing throwing unfinished record samples on SoundCloud and stuff back and forth to each other over the years, which has been good and catching up. Which plays yeah. them back at a low bit rate as well, mind you. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Always download them and play them. Don't listen directly off to SoundCloud. <laughs> Oh, I love I love that that bit crushed kind of sound. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I my name is Mark Maxwell, and I've been producing music now for probably about uh, 17, 18 years. I did a bunch of rubbish music at high school, um, production wise, and then went through a few different aliases, and have settled settled on my actual own name now. Um, producing under that producing house music since 2015 pretty much um i was <clears throat> i went through school had to choose a subject do i do some music subjects do i do some uh for me like my dad's an engineer my brother's an engineer and that's a mechanical engineer not an audio engineer um and <laughs> i had, had to go through school and was choosing, okay, do I choose those subjects or do I do some sort of music? Okay, cool. I went the safe route and did the engineering. Finished school and I go, okay, do I want to go and do music after school or do I want to go and do engineering at uni? I chose a safe option. Get a real job. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Went and did the safe option and, and did the engineering. Got through all my degree and finished that off and it's like, oh, okay, well, do I want to try and do some music now properly? And I actually took I took a year off when I finished uni uh, and just worked rather than going, I, I had an engineering job and rather than going engineering full time, I just did engineering part time, just a couple of days a week. Um, and that was really, really great to put some time into it and learn a bunch and really progress musically. But it got to the end of that year that I'd committed to and I went, oh, okay, cool. I better go and do this full time engineering thing. So I was doing that for five or six years um wearing the high vis and designing and building bits of pieces all around australia and then wow. after the fourth time of applying uh to get in this thing called the red bull music academy uh the fourth time i applied i got in in 2014 and uh went to tokyo for two weeks as part of that which was pretty fantastic experience um there's a great doco on youtube about the the event that they had in New York and for all the participants and that kind of thing, uh, being involved with that. But you might've seen there's a bunch of Red Bull Music Academy interviews and that kind of thing um, online on YouTube that you can check out now. So the Red Bull Music Academy has finished itself now, even though Red Bull goes on. Um, but that was, for me, that was the kicking off point to go full time into music production, pretty much into writing music. Um, and Did that you really point, do one Red Bull Music Academy, or was it more than one? Just the one. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. The one. Okay, yeah, yeah. But there was different stages of it. So it was like Australia and Tokyo. So I, you, it, the way that it works is they take sixty people from around the world, uh, two groups of thirty, and so they'll yeah, take yeah. thirty people to Tokyo. In this case, it was Tokyo for two weeks, and they'll give you a bunch of studios. Uh, They'll put gigs on every night. They'll get you to perform in that city as well and do your own gigs. Uh, they have these great lectures where they have industry professionals come in and chat to everyone as well. Being in Tokyo and Japan, we had a bunch of people from like Korg uh, and a few other sort of synth manufacturers come in and chat, which was really cool, uh, as well as flying people from all over the world to come and 
chat about um about about music pretty much and it's just a free-for-all you can write as much music as you want collaborate with other people um and it's just an awesome experience um but at that point i the 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 sort of the impetus to actually kick off and do music full time was uh just the yeah full support of my girlfriend uh who i'm still with at the moment we've been together forever and um she said hey why don't you give this music thing a proper go do it full time throw yourself at it put some really good lots and lots of hours into it and um yeah. and see what happens and at that point that, that actually <laughs> She was going from I guess that kind of, yeah, go studying part time. Well, she was she was going from studying to going into full time work, and I was going from full time work into effectively unemployment until I got the music stuff on the ground. <laughs> Great, and so starting from the bottom. Um, I guess that's kind of brings us to like the first kind of topic, which I think a lot of people are interested in, and that is how to sustain a full-time living, being a full-time musician, um, you know, so I guess you've, you had a real job with that sort of background and that kind of gives me a bit of insight as well into why you're so technical when it comes to Ableton and your production, like it's just that next level quality. You've got that kind of mindset when it comes to that engineering and, and design and stuff already. So I guess that that makes a lot of sense to me. That I never, I didn't actually know that, but that makes a lot of sense to yeah. me. Yeah. Um, so obviously that support from your partner is one massive thing that's going to help um, give you the opportunity to go full-time music. Is there anything, any tips or what would you like give advice to people that do want to do stuff sort of full-time as a musician? Um, I, I think I, I, I took a little bit of time to work out what I was going to do. Like I, I pretty much in getting into the Rebel Music Academy, I put in my resignation at work and came back to, the new life pretty much. Yeah. Um, and I probably spent at least six months working out what I was going to do, how I was going to spend my time, that kind of thing. I wasn't at all DJing or doing all of that kind of stuff. And it took sort of six months of just sort of working around and going to venues and chatting to people and, and building that up to a point of being able to get a few DJ gigs happening. Um, and yeah, it was six months of, of, of trying stuff out and going, oh, yeah, I don't like doing that. Or, oh, yeah, I, I can do that. <laughs> so I, I sort of went through and I was doing a bit of work, like um, doing mix downs for other people or producing for other people. And at that point, I just, yeah. one, I just didn't have the chops. So it just took, took heaps and heaps of time to do it. And two, I was sort of looking, I, I sort of came through that six months and was like, actually, I just want to work on my own project and concentrate on that and make that really awesome yeah uh, so i sort of at that point stopped stopped doing mixed downs for other people and stopped doing to a degree stopped doing sort of work on spec or like um yeah yeah trying to produce for other people or or, or outside the genre of of house music which is what i've really focused in on um and, and now you're doing more of that stuff though a little bit yeah so i've got a few few different projects on the go but but really it's more, it's still mainly around house music and club music. Yeah. Um, but yeah, took a bit of time to work out what, pr pretty much you'd sort of different income streams and how they could all work together. Yeah. So DJing was one sort of immediate thing um, that I could sort of pick up and start doing. And you can, you can to a degree, DJ as many hours as you want. Uh, you get paid when the venue pays you, hopefully. Um, and and that was something that was sort of rather immediate that I could kick off and, and have happening. Yeah. Um, I then concentrated really heavily on the production and getting records out as well. Um, and through that, none of this I knew five years ago, but like the whole thing with um, like APRA and PPCA and all the stuff that you've gone through, um, yeah. through some of these chats as well, Christian, about... Um, those income streams and how to set those up and, and have them working for you and working well. Um, and the club charting side. And they of take it. a while to pay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's and it, not it, something that, yeah. It ends up, it ends up being a, a long-term commitment and you've got to keep having records coming out um, for that payday that comes in about 18 months from now, hopefully, unless we have another pandemic. 
so what's your uh, what would have been your like kind of bread and, bread and butter that weekly money i, I know that i was I don't, people, a lot of people probably don't know this but i was djing every tuesday night at shark bar in manly playing party tune for five hours and that was my that was my 500 dollars every week and that allowed me to pay my rent and live and then on a friday and saturday i could play the good gigs and sometimes they didn't pay half of that <laughs> what would yeah. your bread and butter be yeah absolutely yeah it's a bunch of bunch of bar gigs um limes hotel was one of them and um, we have Sea Deck come up here every now and then when it's not down in Sydney. Uh, we've got another boat up here called Yacht Club now. Um, various bars and that kind of thing around town was, was the way to go. And it was actually through that that I sort of got to know and meet the, the people that look after the, the bigger venues and the clubs and that Prohibition. kind of thing. Prohibition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that's actually a really good point you made. And that's why I never dismiss doing the non-glamorous gigs they might be 60 to 80 bucks an hour. They might be a hundred bucks an hour. You might have to play music you don't like, but if you do do these gigs, it gives you that opportunity to be a bit more free the rest of the week. You don't have to worry about money. And I think when you're making music, the last thing you want to do is stress about money. You want, you want to be relaxed. Yeah. You want to be able to focus. So I, I know a lot of young DJs out there, they just want to do the best gigs and they don't want to do the shit gigs, but doing the shit gigs gives you the freedom. And it also, you, like you said, you do meet people. You never know who you're going to meet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was through. It Mate, was, your, your gigs sound pretty good, though, actually. Like, yeah, <laughs> I, on a boat was, doesn't sound I was, shit. I was <laughs> really, uh, I was probably, yeah, really, really picky about what gigs I did. I was very much, I knew it's like, okay, as soon as you go down that path of being an open format party DJ, there's a whole yeah. selection of music that you have to have in your catalogue. Um, yeah. And I just, <laughs> Fortunately, I, I managed to find enough of those sort of bespoke bar gigs and that kind of thing where it's like disco house. Wow. Yeah, pretty much. Jealous. Sometimes <laughs> you play some, like some of the early places you could play like some more down tempo electronic type stuff, beatsy type things, but never actually, never actually party gigs. Or like, yeah. Like, like, oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Well, you, you, you're you lucky. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say I've done two ways many weddings at the start. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh my God, some shockers. But, uh, you know, some, sometimes you've got to do that sort of thing. Um, I guess, yeah. So, so far we've got like two or three different revenue streams. You've got your, your gigs, you've got your Mark Maxwell headline gigs, uh, Prohibition and around Australia, you play in Melbourne and Sydney and, and all that sort of stuff. And then yep. you've got your kind of like side gigs. Do you do those other ones under a different name or is it just kind of like they're not really promoted like a... Just not promoted typically, yeah. I'd yeah. Say it's, um, cool. There's a, there's a couple where I would just use my initials. Um, yeah. If, if it needed to be on a flyer that was sort of as a non Mark Maxwell house gig. Um, yeah. And that was just pretty pretty low key. Um, but but yeah, most of them most of them were just sort of not promoted enough to really yeah push it that way. So you've kind of got to have like a bit of. Um you've got to have a bit of, you've got to be outgoing, I guess. Like, you know, someone was, one of the questions we had that inspired this to kind of talk about, you know, the full-time DJ is that there is no brief. There is no school you can go to on how to be a full-time musician. Uh, yeah. There is no degree you can do. You've got to kind of make it up as you go along and you've got to um, be a little bit outgoing and like you, you approached venues or, cause you're in the Sunshine Coast, right? So you, you're talking about doing gigs in Brisbane as well. So you've got to travel. Yeah. So in the initially getting those connections, how was that? Just sending mixes in or? Uh, I, I think, I think having done a little bit of music before I sort of knew a few people and, and actually just going out, going out a few nights and chatting and, and connecting with people that way. And really it, it's, yeah. it's, we chat about more in, in terms of the music production career side of things as well, but it was sort of, you do one gig and then you, you do that for a couple of weeks and then suddenly you're crossing over with two other DJs either before you or after you. And then you're like, Oh cool. Where else do you play? What's happening there? What are they doing? Um, and it was mainly through meeting other DJs um, at the venues themselves after getting that one first gig that sort of connected me through with other people. And then you slowly like Brisbane, fortunately it's Brisbane is pretty small. So you can, you can get a bit of a reputation if you're doing the right thing. And if you're, um, doing the work and turning up on time and that kind of thing. So it, it wasn't too hard in that regard to actually go, okay, cool. I'm playing here. And then you chat to someone else and they're like, Oh, you should check out this place. Um, yeah. As a, 
as a interesting side note and example. So I moved up to the Sunshine Coast uh, almost four years ago because um, my partner got a job up here at the university and I came up and was here for a couple of months. Uh, I, I was and still continue to like go down to Brisbane every fortnight um, or twice a month and do gigs down there and then also do gigs up here on the coast as well. And actually it was through, it's just interesting, through Ramon, having yeah. met him, I'm trying to remember now if we'd been to Canberra you. together or not, or if we hadn't yet met. Oh met yeah, I remember that party. Yet. He was like, hey, this cool guy called Paul, who you can see in our chat at the moment, is up at Legato <laughs> Lounge, you should go and say hello. Um, Cause he's, he's got a club and he's playing house music up there. And I'm like, what? Cool. That's great. Like right on Hastings street in the middle of Noosa. Um, and it's, it's a awesome. Stay away from the tequila, Paul. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and so from what I remember, I sort of turned up there one night, one super, super busy night and sent it. Well, I sent him a message beforehand and said, Hey man, I'm coming out. I want to come say hello. See what you're doing there. Uh, this is me. This is what I do. Um, and so then went met him in person one night and then kept chatting to him and then eventually, eventually did a gig there, which was pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great there, venue. Was playing there once a month or so. Um, and that was just, yeah, through, through Ramon living in Sydney who happened to, yeah, come up to, <laughs> come up to Noosa and play up here as well every now and then. Which is yeah, cool. that's amazing. I, I think that's um, a really good point as to why we're doing this Facebook group and these chats and just trying to connect people because it is pretty much all about who you know. And um, yeah, if, 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 you know, people can get to know each other from that group and, and start to go to different venues and meet up. And yeah, if you're ever in the Sunshine Coast, definitely go to Legato Lounge and stay away from the tequila. <laughs> um, another good point you made is actually going to venues and meeting people. Like a lot of people will say that that is, you know, or sucking dick for gigs, which I absolutely hate because all you're doing is actually going and attending and you're selling yourself and you're actually promoting yourself and you're making contacts. And that is just, it's just necessary. I, yeah. I really dislike how people dismiss putting that effort in and just, they can't be bothered to put that effort in. So they call anyone that does do that or they just suck dick to get gigs. That's bullshit. I'm calling you out on it. It's not sucking dick. It's putting the work in and it's necessary. So I want to remove that terminology from the industry and I want people to stop shaming other people for actually attending gigs and uh, getting gigs that way because it's what you have to do. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the only way as well that you know what kind of music gets played there, how the night flows, what's happening. Like every venue is different. And just to know, yeah, what, just to know that if you're going to turn up and you're going to play music, that it's going to be the right vibe for and it's not just going to completely shock them and what they've been doing there for the last six months or 12 months or whatever they've been building. Um, but I, um, like, I'm, I'm absolutely, I find it, I find it tricky and difficult because I definitely say that I'm an introvert and I pretty much, I switch myself on for the weekend and do my thing and I'm out and about um, and I'm absolutely exhausted by Sunday and pretty much will spend the whole week and not chat to anyone. And that's just the way that I sort of, ebb and flow and get my energy and that kind of thing. Um, but I'm definitely not an extrovert and definitely not someone that uh, has to be in the limelight or anything. It takes a lot of work. Um, you must have done one gig you're ashamed of. You can't tell me there's not one gig that you've done for cash that you're not ashamed of. There's got to be something in there. Um, actually, Bad yeah. wedding. I, I, it's funny, actually. I started off and I started off my DJ career and then probably had a break for about seven years. Cause I was doing high school dances whilst I was in high school with a couple of friends and we would, we would get there and we would have all these CDs lined up. And one of the, one of the mates was an apprentice at a sound and lighting shop in Brisbane and, and we'd rent all the gear and turn up and we'd take, take requests for like the two weeks beforehand for the school that we're playing at and that kind of thing. And, um, it was Get an older lady. Super lame. <laughs> it was um, a lot of fun and super interesting and that kind of thing. Okay. I don't think playing at a high school party as a high school student is lame. If you were maybe our age and doing it, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't tell anyone. Um, amazing, man. So that's, that's really good insight at, into sort of what goes into, um, you know, sustaining a full career as a musician. You've got to have a little bit on your plate and be. Oh, yeah. One last thing one last revenue stream so after getting to a point of getting enough records out 
um, was the remixing side of things. Um, there was a year there where I did like 14 or 15 remixes um, and got into a pretty good routine of doing them. And I just like it being, been in the arts, you just sort of, and creative industries and that kind of thing, you just sort of got to back yourself and value what you're doing. And I started off just going, yeah, okay, it'll be a hundred bucks for a remix. Well, I did a bunch for free to start with. And then it's like, okay, it'll be a hundred dollars for a remix. And then you do a couple of remixes and then you go, okay, well, it's now going to be 150 or $200 or what kind of budget have you got? Can you afford this? This kind of thing. Um, and I got to the point as well, doing more of those that it didn't take up a huge amount of my time. So I could still write new music for myself. Um, but I could do those remixes and that was actually a, a good revenue stream as well. That would help, help things along. Yeah. I think you you've made a good point there by having to kind of like you've kind of got to prove prove yourself first. Like if I look at your track source and your beat pool and I look at your most sell, sold songs, half of them are your remixes. So you know if you're charging five hundred bucks for a oh, remix, don't tell me that. Major, like, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's like you, obviously your latest track, Dance, is number one on Beatport, and that kind of makes sense for that platform. And then yeah. your collaboration with Husky is your most sold on track source, which makes all sense of track source. But then you've also got like your remix for um, Jerk Boys number four, uh, most sold. Uh, and then you've got uh, a remix for Husky and Mikey V right up there. So it's kind of like um, a mixture. And I think if you're like a beginner producer and you're like, oh, I want 500 bucks to remix your track and you've never put out a record, it's unrealistic. You've got to kind of build, build yeah. up to that by having, you know, quite a big back catalog of successful music. Um, especially on platforms like Beatport and TrackSource, which is, you know, sales revenue yeah. for the label. And I've done a bunch of remixes that have never been released that it's unfortunately there's, I'm still, or has been, and still at a point where it's like, okay, cool. I'll do this on spec. And if they like it, they'll release it and they'll pay for it. And if they don't, they just say, no, sorry, it's not right. Or, or, or they'll say, oh, can you do something completely different? And you're like, oh, I've run out of time. I've got other things I want to do. So <laughs> Sorry, that's it. Yeah. Um, it's hard so, to... Yeah. Um, I know good advice that I've always told is as long as you're learning, it's worth it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> sometimes yeah. it doesn't feel like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that might be... Uh, at this point, point, does anyone point have point. any questions? If anyone wants to jump off mute and ask any questions, if anyone is currently trying to sustain a full-time well it's a bit hard right now isn't it <laughs> job keeper that's <laughs> that's how you sustain a full-time dj career <laughs> thanks kane, thanks ATO. kane's got a question by the looks of it yeah kane if you want to unmute yourself or just t type into the messenger thing. okay right. can you hear me yep. yeah all right sweet cool so I've got a question stuff. why are you wearing sunglasses inside <laughs> shut the fuck up <laughs> <laughs> My eyes are a bit fucked up, all right? Leave me alone, cunt. <laughs> but with, yeah, go on. With the remix of stuff, like, yeah, it's hard because you don't know if that one... It's like Ryan Reback. He did a remix for fucking... What's her name? Starly. Starly. And yeah. it's three billion streams, you know? You just never fucking know. Like, I did a remix a couple of weeks ago for Peasants and ATFC, and it's fucking banging. And you're like, fuck, it's an original track, but should I really fucking give it to him or fucking should I not? It's like a hard thing. It's like sick. Oh, I, I definitely. How do you make that decision? Yeah. That as well. And I always, it's the same, it's the same thing with like a record, like an original record, you put something out and you're like, oh, this is the best thing I've ever written. But just trying to switch that in your head and going, no, the next thing I write is going to be the best thing I've written. And it's like, okay, cool. I've, I've done this remix and I put it out, but what I've learned from that and writing my next record is going to be better than that remix again. And it's, it's eventually just going to keep growing and building. And, but you just never know as well, like what might just connect with people. Like I did a remix for let there be house for Seb junior. And it was like one of the biggest records. Oh yeah. Um, like it, it was, it was more popular than the original has more plays on, on Spotify as one of my top tracks on Spotify because it got picked up by a couple of playlists. Um, and you just, and I got, got 150 bucks for it and it's sort of like, sweet. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, I guess the I argument guess there could be is if you did make, if you did make that into an original, you might not have had Seb Junior's name. You might not have had let, let there be house pushing it. So yeah. you kind of like, 
yeah, it's it's just like going to a gig and meeting other DJs, doing these remixes for other labels is yeah. um is going to help with those connections. Um, and the return, what I found as well, the return might not be um the return might not be money. It might not be dollars. Like the, I did a remix for the pot bellies and somehow Roger Sanchez picked up and, and found this remix that he obviously got it through promo or something. And then he played it on a boat in like a cruise ship party boat in Miami. A friend of mine just happened to be watching that video. Shazam the song. Cause he liked it and was like, Oh dude, this is your <laughs> remix. I never would have known otherwise. So he, he sends that to me. And then I send him a message, send Roger, San, Roger Sanchez a message, say, hey, thanks for playing this. And cool, he's got lots going on. And then um, I posted about it. And then I actually got booked at another venue in Brisbane when Roger Sanchez came to play to warm up for Roger Sanchez um, or to do the clothes for Roger Sanchez. And that was simply this, this sort of series of events that started from doing a remix for Potbellies. Um, and you sort of never would have connected the two, but it, it just just happened to click, and that sort of came around that way. I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> I think it's the same. For my, my opinion is it's just make more music. It's like everyone that wanted to push back releases with me during coronavirus because they wanted to release it when the clubs are back, and I said, no, we're still going to release it. Just make me another song. Like I think you need to have that little bit of pressure to keep making tracks and. I think um, I think it's I don't know. You could also just use the template for that remix and make a rig- original out of it. Change the key. I don't know. Put your own vocal over it. I mean, it's cool to have consistency in sound, in my opinion. Um, I guess it's just why would you? Yeah, it's a hard one to answer. <laughs> mm. Yeah, absolutely. But if it's also the best thing you've ever made, don't you want like those artists to hear that? Like, <laughs> they're more likely to hear it if it's that remix going out through that channel. So, yeah. It's a tough one. Um, I guess that probably wraps up the kind of like full-time DJ vibes. And the, the next thing I wanted to chat about um, is sending demos to labels. So, I mean, basically you, you released a few tracks, a few releases with Hot Sunday Records and that a and was done over Facebook Messenger. <laughs> uh, so I think a lot, a lot of people, that's probably not a great approach, <laughs> but that's how we did it. And that's just because more, more or less we were just friends and, um, we were on really good terms, but I guess you've released on a few international labels and now your signs have sweated out, which is, you know, pretty big deal. Congratulations. Cheers. Um, ha- ha- and what was your approach to, to send records to labels and, and that sort of thing? Like what, did, you know, what, what would you write in an email or if, how many I, labels did you send to it? <laughs> yeah, I, I um, tried a few different things, I suppose, early on, tried a few different things in terms of trying to get records signed. And um, through through who you know and that kind of thing, friends of friends and, and people that I knew that were running record labels. Um, but I, I sort of settled on this approach um, for a while there where I would I'd do a list I was, yeah, I had it all up in a spreadsheet and everything where I'd sort of go, okay, cool. This is the record. And these are two top tier labels that have at least the right vibe and the right kind of sound. And I could tell it would fit on their label sound wise and style wise. And then I would have two mid tier uh, labels and then I'd have like two lower tier labels. Um, And I would start with the, top tier and I would send out an email and say, Hey, this is, this is the record or these are a couple of records I've got. I made the mistake early on of, of just sent like finishing something and sending one record um, and sort of understanding now that a lot of labels just, they need to see more material um, or they need to see that you've got three or four or five records that are ready to go. If, if you've only got a couple of a handful of records out already, they need to know that there's something that could follow up with potentially, or they want to do a two track EP or that kind of thing. Um, so I would send, send out to those top tier labels and I would sort of set myself a timer of two weeks to give them a chance to get through the email inbox and have a look at it and come back from touring and uh, find a spare Tuesday morning to listen to their demos and um Maybe sometimes I'd send them a follow-up email as well and just be like, hey, just checking in to see that you got this. Um, Because sometimes stuff happens and you forget about 
what's in your inbox and you go, oh yeah, I really like that record. I'll reply to them later and then never reply. Um, and so sometimes the sort of the, the refresh sort of helps in terms of trying to um, get back in someone's ear. So yeah, pretty much after two weeks, I'd then step down and go to my mid tier label. So rather than just emailing everyone all at once and hoping something sticks, <laughs> I'd start with MailChimp. <laughs> yeah, I'd start with who I would absolutely love it to go out with and then, and then step down. And these were typically as well, like labels that are like these, Top ones are dream labels. Mid ones are like, okay, they're, they're on the way to the dream. Uh, and the lower levels are sort of people I know and connected with and, and maybe it's smaller labels starting out, that kind of thing. Um, so I'd go through two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. And if by the time I got to the lower tier label and no one liked the record... You decided to Hot Sunday Records. <laughs> <laughs> and if, uh, if Hot Sunday said no, uh, if, I, if I still like the record then I'd go and do an independent release. Yeah. And just put it out because that was the thing so, working out. Are these well tracks on, um, oh, sorry, just quickly. Are these tracks, are you, play, are you sending a SoundCloud playlist? Because I know you can check who like plays it on SoundCloud, right? Is that something you've done? Yeah, pretty much. It was always SoundCloud, yeah. So yeah. You, can, you know if the person you've sent it to has actually listened to it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And sometimes like people just don't have time. You, you look at that as well and say, okay, if I send someone an email, with a demo uh, and they haven't checked it in a couple of weeks, maybe they don't have time to actually give my record the time it needs to release it properly anyway. Or maybe they've got other focus. Maybe they're, they're, um, there's a bunch of labels that will, they have a roster of artists already and they're only releasing those. Or um, a label that exists only to release the main artist and a couple of friends um, because it's just a small thing. It's not a big, is not a big label uh, like Hot Sunday that's putting out a bunch of different artists and supporting them that way. So there's working that out as well. Um, and also, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I sort of felt like the visibility in your track record makes a makes an impact on on what labels are going to look at you or take you on and that kind of thing. If you're a only got two records out, no matter if the record could be absolutely fantastic, but Defected are not going to sign that one because um, there's no track record there. There's no history. There's no, um, how do they know that you're going to sort of support the record and do the right thing and, and, and build things that way. And not necessarily just number of likes and follows and that kind of thing you have, but just the history of having a back catalog of music that you've been, you've been at this, you've been working this. Um, so yeah, I'd yeah, say through those labels and then uh, do an independent release uh, if, if no one else jumped on it. And then at least I'd have a record out and then I could write a new record, start the process again. Um, and for me, I felt that it was, it was important to keep that consistent release schedule out. Um, and that's the only other way that someone can find your music is if you're putting music out is if you are, so I heard something the other day saying Spotify is just like social media. It's like, no one can hear you unless you're putting your records out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. A hundred percent. You hear a lot of stories about um, different labels that have rejected or, you know, in initially said no to really, really big tracks. And then later on signed them. Like I think finally was one of those tracks um, by oh, Kids yeah. Tomorrow. I've heard, I don't know how true it is, but apparently they said no to it at first. And it wasn't until like a year later that they actually went, oh, actually, you know what? Maybe we will, we will sign this. And that's like, and, and I mean, you even hear about that, those kind of stories with people writing books and publishers and <laughs> that sort of stuff. No, it takes 20 people to say no, but someone find just because someone says no, doesn't mean your song's not good. Yeah. And you gotta, you gotta also sort of back yourself and, and also try to find the right label for your, um, for your record as well. Uh, is really important. Yeah. The right kind of style that's going to fit. Yeah, there's no point. Do your, do your reconnaissance, do your homework. There's no point sending a dubstep record to a house label or even, you know, the genre as a house is of so specific now that, yeah. you, you know, once you write a record, you might need to do a bit of digging on Beatport and track source and, and finding a, something that's, you know, you know, sounds the same as what you've made and sending it to them first. Um, yeah, some labels are because, really, really narrow in terms of the sound that they put out and others are really, really broad. 
Would you so agree that hot Sunday is quite broad? Yeah, exactly. hundred percent. We like, I guess we're a little bit different because we're kind of releasing music because we want to like encourage people to release. We want to build people up. So we've got a bit of a different level of music and different styles. And it's just as long as it's kind of good music, um, you know, we're, we're keen to, re to release it really. I, I yeah. don't really want to pigeonhole all that the label. I want to have it a bit more free. Um, and that's just, that's just a personal choice really. Um, yeah. We do have Disco Fiasco Records, which is a little bit more funky and disco -y as well. So we're putting tracks on that too. And that's kind of got more of a narrow, um, you know, style. That's a yeah, little bit got, less open. Yeah. But at least, at least having, having your sort of fingers in both pies that you could sort of go, oh, okay, cool. This is a great demo. Not for Hot Sunday. However, this is a Disco Fiasco record or that kind of thing. Probably if my mum listened to Hot Sun Air Records, she'd be like, this is all the same. <laughs> but, but for us who know our genres and, and all that sort of stuff, I guess it's a little bit more, bit more open than, than some other ones that are quite indie and underground. Um, and that's, I mean, that's just me. That's just me because I love to work with people as well. Yeah, yeah <laughs> The absolutely. record's good. I don't want to say no to someone because it's not the it's perfect brand. If it's a good record and they're a good person, I want to work with them as well. And, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, I love working with them you've probably found as well that any, any one of your records could be played during one night, whether it's early, whether yeah. it's late, whether it's four o'clock in the morning, there's a space for every single one of the records that Hot Sunday's put out. Yeah, hundred percent. And you actually never know what's going to pop on Spotify or like even at my own records, like I'm surprised about which ones like get playlisted and um and editorials and stuff like i just recently re yep. released a track that has a two minute 30 radio edit and apple music um chugged the extended mix in all the editorials i'm like <laughs> why did i make a radio edit <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's good to have a bit of an open taste as well um i think some artists that might want to have a really specific style of sets and that sort of stuff it's good to release very a very direct and, and obvious um kind of like style and have a really solid direction but it's, I, I like having a bit of bit of fun with my sets and playing a whole variety of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and that's and I think that's probably what I found production wise as well. And I've done a, a, a bunch of different stuff because I sort of started listening to house um, early two thousands, going to as many sort of underage gigs and stuff as I could, and and summer field days. And back then it was it was still p pre EDM, and it was like vocal house was a big thing, and I was. I've still got like this CD that was mixed by GT Ministry of Sound <laughs> Clubber's Guide or something. And it's yeah, a bunch of great like vocal house stuff, which I sort of feel like has come is actually coming full circle yeah. now. Um, but yeah, it went, went that actually, the, the um, what's it called? Like the fidget and all yeah. that stuff and EDM and everything. And so yeah, um, that, that actually reminds me because we were just in ADA and uh, that's another great place to pitch your records. Like you brought a USB full of records to Amsterdam Dance Event. Um, yeah. So I guess that's another really good, and it's just what reminded me of Amsterdam Dance Event is Sugar Star calling the, pe the period of EDM music, EDM depression. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But yeah, maybe tell us a bit, bit about that and how important it is to attend music conferences and, and, and that sort of stuff. Cause that can help with the, your networking as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was, um one one to be able to actually get the face-to-face -face time with people but also to um show face and say hey i'm here i'm i'm actually taking this all seriously i'm investing in it and and making making the most of it um it didn't work out in the end but we almost had a record signed to black sold peasants label um and it was there actually that i met um Matt and Danny from Club Sweat and we sat down at a cafe and had a coffee and um, yeah, started, started speaking about this deal, which was good to sort of kick that off. You actually have office. to go all the way to Amsterdam to meet half of the Australian music industry. <laughs> you yeah, actually end up, yeah, I've been four or five times now and literally you spend more time with everyone from Australia in one week in Amsterdam than you probably would ever do in Australia. Yeah. And that's it. It's that great, like, um, really intensive time together and and that's sort of living up here on the sunshine coast it's it's yeah you got to got to put the effort in to get down and connect with people um 
and get out of the comfort zone and that kind of thing. So that was, yeah, been to EMC a couple of times um, and then now been to ADE once as well. Um, but also just doing, I've, I've been fortunate enough with, with my booking agent one hit to, to just be, they would just say, Hey, you get yourself to Sydney or you get yourself to Melbourne and they'll fill the weekend full of gigs, which has been really, really great. Um, doing a bunch of bar gigs and then a club gig here and there and that kind of thing. And that's been another great way to actually connect with people face to face is so, um, so valuable. And it will be something that's, it's must be really hard for you guys down there to, to not have that at the moment, to be able to, to be face to face with people. Yeah, it's a crazy, um, it does suck. That's probably a good point that if you want to do your thing, to have this as a full-time career, actually having management and booking agents and having a big team is going to help you as well. You want people to, to sell for you and sell you um, to venues. And I know, I know Matt is great. Like he obviously does all my tours as well. And he does book a lot of, um, you know, bars and stuff as well. So a lot of his touring artists, when they've got a night off, he'll slot them in for a, a cheeky bar gig because he knows that he wants them to make money and, and that sort of thing. So that's, that's a yep. good getting, getting the right agents a really good one. It's probably not something you need to rush into. Um, you make sure you go with someone respectable and reputable as long as they'll have you. Um, that came so that's, from, that's, that's from gigs as well. And from word of mouth, and it was actually through like playing at prohibition. I think Matt came up, maybe one of the nights you were playing. Um, yep. and, and Josh, who books me at prohibition got in his ear and said, Hey, you should, you should look at Mark. He's doing good things here. Um, which, which really helps. Yeah, being Actually, here. Josh linked us together as well. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. You, yeah. You're unofficial manager. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, before I forget as well, I wanted to um, highlight how important it was that you said waiting two weeks, like sending it to a label and waiting two weeks. I had someone send me a record and they mess they sent this email and it was beautiful. And I was like, I love your label. I really, really want to release on your label. Please check out this demo. And for some reason, I just didn't listen to it for five days. You know, heaps of shit's going on. I've moved house twice in three months, whatever. I listened to it and I replied, I'm like, yeah, this is sick. I love this. I want to sign it. They're like, oh, sorry, it's already been signed. I'm like, well, you mustn't like my label that much if, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you've already signed it somewhere else and haven't even given me a, a chance to listen to it. So yeah. be careful with what you write in your email because if you're going to confess your love to a label and then <laughs> sign it to somewhere else in 24 hours, you'll just I will like die before it signs to any other label. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say even like if it's, if it's a label like maybe defected or tour and, you know, give them three weeks because... I passed, well, Tour Room's been doing a lot of, um, taking a lot of our tracks for their compilations and stuff. And they took one of our artists' tracks for a compilation and then we sent them one of the artist's originals and it took him two weeks to reply. And it, that's how long it took him to listen to it. And, and it wasn't of interest, but how pissed off would you be if, you know, you didn't, you were too impatient to wait that two weeks. They said yes. And you, you then had to have a really heart to heart conversation with another label about how you want to sign it to Tour Room and not them. Like that's, not in yeah. a position anyone wants to put themselves in. It's just, that's not fun. Yeah. You might ruin, you might burn a bridge by doing that. So yeah, absolutely. Be patient. Or, or as well, you, you get that same issue as if you go out to too many people at once and then, and then um, label A says yes in a couple of days. And then tour room comes along two weeks later and says yes. And it's like, ah, oh, bugger, I've screwed yourself. Um, and by I that point, I you might have signed a contract definitely. and everything. Uh, I think my internet's a bit dodgy and you're hearing me like 20 seconds later, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> so I've had, a, I've had a lot of different advice over the years from different management. And some people have said, send one or two records or just one record. Whereas I've always thought, you know, kind of like as long as the sound is consistent, the more is merrier, you know, if you've got eight mastered tracks and your direction is clear and the sound of all those records is consistent and, you know, you've got like an eight month um, plan or a 12 month plan of how you would like to see those released, but you've also got the flexibility to change into accommodate the label. I think a label really likes to see that, um, you know, especially like, it just would be weird if you sent basically like one style track and then the next track was totally different. You know, that would, would be something I wouldn't do when sending demos to a label. I'd yeah. send the right sound to the right label, a few tracks if you've got them, preferably mixed and mastered as well i i what, what's your opinion on that mark do you send a fully I, finished track or a draft i try and get it as finished as i can um and 
at least to a point where I'd be happy to play it out. I'm no mastering engineer. Um, so the, the most that I will do typically, so they don't have to go and reach for the volume knob as soon as I send them a SoundCloud link, cause I'll run it, run it through a limiter and just push it up a bit. Um, yeah. and that's, that's about all I do. I do a little bit of like final mix EQ side of things. If it's, if there's stuff out of whack, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've, yeah, never really, I suppose, been able to afford to go and get someone else to master it before sending a demo off, knowing quite well that they might have comments or um, yeah. I might want to change things down the line. But at least getting it to a point where it's loud enough that they can hear it and, um, and, and, and a clean enough mix that they can understand what's going on. Yeah, I guess you've got to have that, again, that little bit of patience. Like, I know I've definitely been really impatient and send stuff that's <laughs> definitely could have used a little bit more work on the mix you know there's no harm in waiting a week to send a demo if you can get the track sounding better in a week you're better off waiting a week getting it a little bit tighter and i think obviously we can't do it now but um testing it out in the club is a really yeah. good one you would be able to see the crowd's reaction yeah absolutely and i think that um that routine that I got into with sending off demos as well is once you're into that and you're writing, say you're writing new records every couple of weeks and you're finishing them, then as you are, I found it really hard to sort of write something, sign it, it would release. And then I'd be like, Oh shit, I've got to write another record and I'd be panicking then. But at least if I got to the point where I sort of started feeding that production line of, okay, here's a demo. Then you try and get it signed then you finalize the mix, then you send it off and get it mastered and then it gets released. And if you've got a bunch of those things concurrently happening, you never feel like um, you have to rush anything because you've always got stuff that's, that's in progress, that's happening, that's working, that's coming out. Yeah, perfect. Um, at this point, does anyone have any questions? You can take yourself off mute and ask a question or just chuck it in the chat, guys. Oh yeah, I got a question. I got a couple of questions actually. Yeah, go for it. Um, so one was about, um, when you're choosing like what labels you want to release on and you've kind of got that, like, uh, kind of focus where you want to be at, is it better to have just more of a, uh, set mind where it's like, it doesn't matter what label you get with as long as like to make your tunes more appropriate with yourself, if you, if you know what I mean? Like, because when, um, I felt like when I first released my first tune, I had such a high uh, ego where <laughs> I felt like um, everything had to be perfect for, for a particular label I wanted to be on. But all I did was I just made a basic kind of really nice deep house tune. And then I was like, all right, let's just send it to a label I like. And they responded back to me and release me my question sorry with that is when you're making tunes is it better to have less anticipation to write better than to be disappointed kind of like an, an expectations so like yeah. you know so i guess you're pretty lucky there that you've had the label um say yes yeah um what are you gonna do to, to prepare to say I no i know a lot of people does that have do a speech impediment if it sounds bad sometimes no you're all right mate um thanks for asking the question we appreciate it I think you can't have too high expectations, but you also do want to reach for the stars. Why not send it to your favorite yeah. label? Um, I, I would say if you are going to send it to your favorite label, I would get it mastered professionally. Uh, I think if it's like a really big label, um, if it's yeah. the first time, if it's your first time um, contacting the, this label um, and, you, and you, know, you want to set up a good impression first yeah. up, you want to have the email written really nicely and you want this track to absolutely sound amazing. If, you're, if your expectations are that high, then your level of, of production and all that sort of stuff. You know, you might even want to find someone that is going to intro you to the A&R of that label. I like do a bit of research, ask around on Facebook, you know, you know, I don't know if anyone, anyone else in this chat, if you've got a, a release for say tour room, which affected myself, Mark, or someone knows someone who can link you up. So, you know, sometimes it's better to have an introduction from someone that's already in with them. Um, again, double check that the track is up to the standard. Get yep. people that are going to be completely honest to you and that aren't going to just tell you your song's sick. Yeah. Um, well, that's what uh, I did. Yep. I, uh, yeah. First, I sent it to my mate slash favorite producer, Black Loops, and was like, hey, yep. what do you think of this? And then he's like, 
dope. <laughs> that's def- like, that's yeah. definitely someone you wanted uh, advice from. Well, fucking send us the tune, man. I yeah, think man. so. So another, I was just like kind of reading into what you were saying there. Like you made that track um, for that label. Is that what you were kind of saying? No. So I, it was basically just the track that was going through an emotional feeling I was feeling at the time because the track's called Bliss, and it, yeah, and it's all about just relaxation and all that because at the time I was going through a really bad time so me and my mate decided yeah. let's just make a tune and we made that but when it came to labels I was like shooting for the stars I was like I wanted on like this final release of Neo Vinyl and etc <laughs> and then this other label that I friggin love that has yeah. released with Black Loops and everything like that um, they had a Facebook link and you just sent your demos through a really? Facebook and then, yeah, like the next day, um, they, sorry, my Responded. speech. Um, That's all right. Uh, they sent me an email back saying, yeah, we love it. We want it. And then, um, yeah. And that the funny thing with that was they weren't necessarily the main thing I was like wanting. Mm. But I feel like because of that, my ego was kind of like, I need, <laughs> I, I, you know, like, I don't think, it's as good as what I wanted to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, it's done really well. Like it charted on uh, Amsterdam dance event and everything like. I think when you're looking for a label, you're looking for, you're looking for either one or two things. And what a record label is, it's either a friend or, or it's a bank. And or a foe, yeah. <laughs> so, well, it's uh, the way I see it is like a friend or a bank. You, like, Cause you can release oh, okay. music independently, right? But if you're sending these records to labels like that and you're a new artist, you might want a big label to give it the tick of approval. And then other artists are going to give it maybe a little bit more attention and credit and a bit more, um, you know, time of the day than if it was released on, on another label. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, well, send us a link to that in the chat and we'll, and we'll check that out, man. Um, yeah, I'll send, awesome, Bliss, sure. <laughs> thanks for the question. Um, so there you I, go. I've got one more as well. Oh, yeah, go on. Okay. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, go Another thing with that that I struggle with, and especially when I'm trying to mean, like when you're talking about context, when you're talking about getting good with labels and talking about, you know, approaching yourself and making yourself very open and friendly. So you're welcomed, basically. Um, yeah. What, how, how, I, this is a question for you, either one, doesn't matter, but yeah. how do you find communication? Because the thing is with, that I struggle with is, especially when it's foreign, it's really yeah. hard to maintain oh, yeah, communication sure. really well. And what is the way that you found that, uh, that is, um, that works well. So you maintain that communication. So it does, they don't think that you're not responding to them and et cetera. And you're basically still in that friendly court of sort. What do you think, Mark? I, I I'm, I'm someone that's, absolutely terrible at keeping communication up with people, especially in different time zones and have to make a real concerted effort, even to just stay connected with friends in different time zones. And I worked that out. I was on student exchange straight after school, went to Switzerland for a year and I pretty much just didn't talk to my friends back in Australia at all um, for, for a year. Um, but that was the only way that I could really immerse where I was then obviously things are completely different now with social media and everything, but I, for me, I get a lot of value of with the face to face and being able to connect with people, not necessarily chatting business, um, but actually being able to hang out. And, and that would be for, for the main like industry connections that I have where they, the, the most sort of, um, the, the greatest relationships in those have come from actually spending physical time with people hanging out when you can. And it's the kind of thing that like through um, going to Canberra with Christian and that kind of yeah. thing and catching up at gigs um, has been, has been the most valuable. I think thing growing a relationship is, is something you can't rush. You can't rush growing a relationship. You can't just, you can't fake and become someone's best friend, you know, overnight. I think it's something that just does take years. And I think, um, People love when, when, when they see that you show support. It's like an att- attending an event. Um, you know, if you're, if you're actively replying to their Instagram stories and making conversations, if you're, you know, you don't want to be a stalker, but <laughs> if you're commenting on their Facebook and Instagram posts, if you're just trying to make genuine communication over things you're mutually interested in, 
I think over a period of years, um, that that friendship will grow and that communication will, will just become a lot more natural. Yeah. And yeah, so you uh, utilise the internet. Yeah. And I, I in, in valuing the face-to-face, -face, it's probably a good segue towards the... Um, I started a Sunshine Coast music producer group up here. Um, and simply for that fact of knowing that uh, I was terrible at keeping in touch with people online um, and wanted to try and build the local scene and, and try and support that and have, we had a bunch of great venues, like Sunshine Coast is quite sort of spread out. There's a bunch of great venues in different spaces um, and people that look after different venues weren't necessarily talking to each other and supporting each other. We sort of, we're all together and too small to be fighting against each other kind of thing. So in starting the uh, producer group at the start of last year, uh, Colour Castle came along and did our first, uh, our first presentation, which is really good. And we've had 20 to 25 people each month getting together, um, chatting music production and, and writing tunes and helping each other out. And, and since then, you've had a few you guests, guys, you? Oh, yeah. yeah, a few different guests. So we've had Klaus come on via Zoom. Um, last month, well, this month, actually, we had a, uh, a guy from, he used to work with Native Instruments for um, the sort of machine marketing side of things and also doing a bunch of stuff with collaborating with uh, artists in East Africa. Um, and what else have we had? Yeah, just sort of, a, I'd sort of throw on a presentation about kick drums one day and we've had someone come in and do like music theory for the music producers, that kind of thing. But interestingly, um, the whole the whole idea about that was, hey, there's, there's great groups online and there's great YouTube channels that you can learn music production, um, but trying to find somewhere that people can get together face to face um, has been really good. And we've we've been fortunate enough to, have the support from the Noosa Council here. So the venue that we do it in is is a Noosa Council run building that's for um, co-working space, tech startups and that kind of thing. Um, but they've got this space that they let out to different community groups to do stuff. Um, and so, yeah, we meet there once a month and it's been great. And, and a, it, there's sort of like these, yeah, a couple of guys in the UK that are right into drum and bass that were a few years older than us, but was right there on the front line as drum and bass was blowing up in the UK and that kind of thing. Um, know all the, know all the right um, venues and, and record stores and that kind of thing. We've had um, one of the guys that comes to our group currently works for Apple for the sort of logic and synth development team and that kind of thing. Have you guys ever seen, wow. um, he's come along with one of them actually. He, have you ever seen through Splice, you're looking up samples and one will come up as Zen, Zen Heiser. Yep. There's a bunch of them on there. And the guy that runs Zen Heiser lives on the coast here up at, up near Noosa. So he's come along to one of our sessions. Get um, us some free sample packs to the group, mate. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Um, How does someone local get involved with this? Uh, send me a message. Uh, we've, we've just set it up. It was originally, it's just sort of a private Facebook group. Um, because we sort of wanted to keep it really for the people on the ground here in the, in the, in the area. Um, yeah. Sunshine Coast producer group can be found on, on Facebook. And there's been a couple of things that have come off the back of that. That has been the, um, we did a DJ residency where we actually got some council funding, uh, what's called the regional arts development fund. Um, got some council funding to run a week of DJing lessons and workshops. And so we did 33 one-on-one, -on -one, one hour DJ lessons free for people in the community. And that was run by and um, run by DJs in the producer group. So they were getting paid an hourly rate to run the lessons. Uh, the community got it for free. Um, and we had a whole lot of stuff happening, which was really cool. And then we did like a masterclass one night and then we did a, one morning we did like a young kid. So it's kids from like seven to 12 doing DJ lessons. And we just went around and we like beg, borrowed and stole decks from people and speakers and stuff to make sure we had enough gear and equipment. We did another um, like a music production 
residency. So I moved my studio down to the corner of this foyer space for a week and wrote music and people could come in and chat to me and ask questions and that kind of thing. Um, did a couple of like workshops as part of that as well. Also all sort of council funded. Uh, and most recently we did this songwriting workshop uh, weekend, what we call start sequence. And that's where we got six producers and six songwriter, vocalists, instrumentalists. It all come together on a Saturday morning and they got randomly paired together when they were, and, and from there, they then had to write a song by the end of the weekend, by Sunday afternoon. And we had uh, Paulie Bromley from the beautiful girls and George come along and cause he runs a local studio here, um, come along and mentor and help out and um, help people through those creative challenges. Uh, and it was, yeah, awesome. Worked, worked really, really well. The six great songs that have been finished um, that will then go and get mastered. And then um, they'll just go and independently release them. Yeah. So that was another, another sort of project that we've been doing up here. Amazing. Yeah. I'm not going to lie after doing that initial, um, the first little talk, I was playing up at Legato Lounge, wasn't I? Or yeah, was it old? old yeah, I um, think so. Yeah, one old, of those. Uh, yeah. Old yeah, Soul. Um, old Soul, that's right. And the... Um, What's that Sunday boat party? Uh, Catalina. Yeah, that was, yeah, that's Catalina. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, I found that so inspiring. And I think I got back to Melbourne and I'm like, I'm going to do this in Melbourne and then never got around to doing it. Um, and I guess like, you know, a lot of the stuff you've done there is, is what's inspired the, the Hot Sunday Records group and just like getting people together and actually just getting, you know, everyone's helping each other out. And I think that's kind of like a lot of people, I guess, are sitting in a room by themselves, they're making songs by themselves, they're yeah. mastering their own tunes and they might not have that kind of atmosphere of that working with other people. And I think that's just like half of the fun of music, you know, yeah. it's so much fun working and being around other people. And I'd, I'd really recommend that as soon as things start opening up or if you're in an area that that is open currently, no matter how sort of big or small the town you're in is look out for those council buildings. Maybe it's a, a spare room in a library or something like that, that you can do it. I, um, I went along to, so there's Ableton Live user groups all over the world. Um, and I got a huge amount of value out of going to Ableton Live user group in Brisbane for years and years and years. And we did, it was like back corner of a cafe on a Saturday afternoon. And then it was um, at a bar somewhere. And then it was in a, in a nightclub on a Saturday afternoon as well. And then we did one of the guys that was running that actually got employed by SAE in Brisbane. So then he was able to actually like bring us all into, into a lecture theater in SAE um, to run the Ableton live user group. And I've seen that around Sydney and Melbourne and stuff, there's um, Ableton live user groups as well, from what I understand. Um, but the tricky thing is, and it's the thing that we've been working towards here with this group is to actually get a core group of people together that are all keen to do it because it's really fatiguing to have one person plan, organize, send the mail out every month and try and keep something going. Um, and I wanted to be able to get to a point <clears throat> where um, if I can't do a month, I can't do a month and it still happens. Or if I can't do three yeah, months, yeah. it still happens, which is really, which would be, uh, yeah, really, really, really. So you have like a core group of leaders. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, sweet. I'll be starting one in Sunbury. If anyone out in the uh, sticks wants to do it, <laughs> you'd be surprised. Oh, I'm sure there'd be a couple out there. Yeah, but the Riddles, camp, Riddles yeah. Creek producer group, all the geese on the main street are going to come and make some sick beats. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome, man. Uh, you do so much, and it's, it's all super, super inspiring, and um, I, I love it. And I think you've given us heaps and heaps of information, and we've already gone over an hour. Do you have a question, Harry? Pardon? Did you have a question? Sorry, I think I accidentally unmuted myself. Oh, well, it's great to see you, beautiful face. <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll get um, Kate always. <laughs> you too. Just, yeah, thanks, Mark. I appreciate that, mate. Thanks hey, no me. worries. No All worries. Best. Thanks for coming along. I don't know if we want to go just yet. I want to, I want to actually just quickly, before we do go, I want to ask you, because you do still do some production lessons with people, right? Yeah. You're kind of teaching people. Yeah. So and It's uh, on your pa Patreon, right? Yeah. So what I've been doing, I, yeah. So I've been doing the, the production lessons. Um, for a couple of different people. Mainly, it was originally it was just like for people that are absolute beginners. Um, I did up this like six week yeah. curriculum 
um, and then have just been doing that. But then since then, there's a couple of people that it's they just sort of come come week to week with a with a record or a bunch of records and say, hey, can I just get a, a heap of feedback on on what I've been working on? And we'll just throw a bunch of ideas around and they'll sort of move on from there. Since the lockdown side of things, I kicked off Patreon as well. Um, and that was a way, I suppose, one, like the whole thing with Patreon, I think is that it's it's people that like what you're doing and want to support you in some way become a subscriber on Patreon and, and it just sort of ticks along month to month. But I'd set up a couple of different tiers. So second tier from that would be a, like a private, um, what's it called? Yeah. Like feed specific feedback for a, for one song per month for what, whatever you've been working on. Um, so there's a couple of people that I, that I've been doing that for as well that are in that tier. And they'll just send me a link, YouTube link, and I will I will just sit there for like 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever it takes, and give them the most detailed feedback about whether it's the songwriting side of things, whether it's the mix down, or whether it's whatever it is in that record. And I, I think the thing with feedback as well um, that's really, really valuable is to understand that there's lots of different types of feedback. And you can send stuff to a mate and, and you might just in sending them to a mate, you might just want them to say, Hey man, this is a sick tune. So you feel better. Um, but then you might send it to someone else and go, actually, I'm going to send this to miscellaneous label a that I absolutely love. And I want to know it's amazing. Um, and you'll send it to someone and say, Hey, I've done all the writing. I've done all the mix down. Can you just tear it apart and tell me what's up? Um, and by having that understanding of, of, of asking for a specific type of feedback, can be really useful because I don't want to, I don't want to go through and give someone a bunch of feedback on their mix down. If they're like, Oh no, I've only just finished writing it. I haven't done the mix yet. Um, cause it's just a waste yeah. of time. So this, this Patreon side of things was sort of streamlining that a bit. So I've got a couple of questions of like, where are you at? Have you done the mix? Um, have you finished the songwriting? Um, because yeah, you, on one hand as well, you don't want them to be, be like, Oh, this song's finished. And then you give them a whole lot of feedback and go, actually there's, it just feels like there's no hook there or there's, there's nothing interesting happening or, or the arrangements out those kind the of things. Sucks. Yeah. Like working, working through those. I don't know. I sort of liken the, the, the steps of the process of idea and sound and hook generation. And then you go into structure arrangement songwriting stuff and then you go through and do the mix and you, you can't you can't fix shitty sound design with a good mix it just doesn't work it's you got to have something something there um we'll put a link to your patreon in the uh youtube description and in, in the facebook group as well yeah yeah and with that as well every couple of weeks i've just been throwing up a video whether it's a track walkthrough or a uh, i've got my my template that i start every song with uh any i love ableton that you can like make make a rack or make a preset oh, yeah. or something like that and build stuff up. And I'll, I'll do a lot of stuff with that and save the rack and send it off to people as well. So it's not, not necessarily about um, bespoke um, learnings. It's sort of like, Hey, this is how I do something. And then sharing that information. Can you, all right. Can you give us a little bit of feedback now? Or maybe what the right question is like, what are the most common kind of mistakes you would find in, in like people's tracks from beginner to intermediate like what what are the every time you listen to a track you're like oh they need to fix this uh it's been a couple of things um like if 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 you're like me and you're you're very limited musical knowledge uh and this day with like grabbing samples and stuff you can quite easily mix and match samples that are in in different keys and get that kind of thing wrong so making sure all that the key or samples are in the right key or at least work well together. The other thing I find as well is um, sort of the same way with key is syncopation and swing and that kind of thing as well. And making sure that, um, yes, you can have all your parts working melodically together, but then having them also work um, rhythmically. It's like a consistent together. swing. Like if you have two different swings going on at the same time or something. Yeah, like you get a lot of techno rhythms that are all really straight and they won't have any swing at all. And then you'll get like a, a garage house, jack in house kind of thing. And it will be like huge, huge, huge amount of swing. Um I've got an example here. Let me just do a quick Yeah, please do. There. 
This is going to send mine to the end. Are still active? Say that again, sorry? Are both, uh, like, Ableton Group still active at the moment? I don't... I'm not sure, actually. I know the one in Brisbane was running, being run by Pete Trimbacher. Oh, okay. He's in yeah, the that's Europe probably not. <laughs> oh, he's in Europe, yeah. Yeah, he's in Berlin, yeah. Um, but I'm not sure. It's the kind of thing, though, as well. It's, I don't know how official or unofficial it is if you want to kick it off and start it up again. What um, about your uh, uh, Sunshine Coast one? Yeah, yeah, once a month. Every... The second Thursday night every month. And we've sometimes had people... It's Yeah, if you're willing to drive up, come along and join us. Um, we've had a couple of people come up from the Gold Coast as well for sessions that have been yeah. interested. So, uh, so are, you, are you in Brisbane, Chris? Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll have to hit Max up at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Absolutely. Legend. Uh, you guys can all see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, so I'll just play this loop here. Okay, so what kind of like syncopation or rhythm would you say that has, Christian? Um, straight. Which one? Which one are you yeah. playing? Yeah, yeah that's pretty straight. Put a, it was really straight. Put a click with it. Put a click. Oh yeah, it is straight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then this one here. Oh yeah. Swung as a motherfucker. So then you you put those two things together, and you might think, oh, okay, great. They're same tempo. Doesn't worry about the key because they're, they're just drums and a. In a loop and it just sort of doesn't it's the first thing i hear is it just doesn't feel like it's gelling um anyway there's, there's a couple of different ways you can work that out one you can either same same way that you can get a sample and you can shift it up or down and key you get a sample and shift the the timing of it or shift the syncopation if you need to um and the grooves are really great in ableton live to be able to do that um and you can do it just by ear. So I, I would just listen to this and go to the groove pool. Um, and I just love all the MPC ones. Yeah, it's the same. Guilty pleasure. Man. And then I'll just cycle through. That one there is great. And then maybe these ones are a bit too swung. So you can yeah. find that middle ground to go. So do you have multiple grooves on your um, in your selective channel? You want the same groove consistent over the whole track. So yeah. you've got different groove. Well, I guess like, you know, maybe, I mean, in theory, right, Mark? Yeah, you want them, you want them to be like I think within reason, like thinking thinking of um, each of these elements as a different member in the band, if they're all jamming along, grooving together, it's going to sound tight. Um, if one person is just very straight and everyone else is swinging, it's going to sound out of place. So if, if, if you've got a mix of things that are all pretty close, then it's going to work. Um, if you've got a bunch of stuff that's really close and something that's not then it's going to sound completely off sort of like someone playing in a different key or, or or that kind of thing but the um i don't know if you've ever seen this you can grab a midi clip and you can then drop the groove in and so you can then see the the syncopated note here oh my god no i did not know that <laughs> so now i can have a look at this is this is the one that's syncopated and i can have a look at that and then go 61 oh okay 61 still early compared to that one. Okay, so let's go and grab a different one. Let's grab the 65. Okay, cool, we're getting close. Make sure we keep bringing it back to the start. Okay, sweet. So now that's, okay, maybe go to 69. So anyway, just, just jumping through a few different ones there. I've then found one that's pretty close to what's there. And we'll go another one down. So that's the 68. So you can no. hear it's pretty tight. And you can also see that it's pretty tight there as well. And then I can then go and apply that same groove to that, um, what, what is it, 68. 
make sure you commit to the group. And work out what what warp mode and stuff's going to work because obviously that's doing some really major adjustments. Or you might even come in here and go and grab all of this and quantize it back straight again. Yeah. And then push this one straight. Working out sort of like if you're working with different keys, you're either shifting something up or down semitones to be in key with something else or you're shifting something up or down in terms of syncopation to get them to work. Or you might go and find some sort of middle ground. Maybe you've got a bunch of other stuff that's already at a certain groove and you want that to be, be in together. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's one other thing I hear quite a bit as well is that, the sort of mismatch of grooves and that kind of thing. Um, and maybe just tracks that potentially just don't have some sort of hook in them. Um, yeah. And it can be a really, really great, like a, I love a great bass line that just works with a solid kick drum uh, and you've got some good drums supporting it, um, but getting something in there that's going to be the, Hey, what is it? What are you going to listen to this track and go, oh, I've never heard that before. Or what are you going to yell out on the drop or whatever, that kind of thing. And it, it could be as simple as some stupid words here and there and little taglines before it come in, but making sure that there's some sort of hook there. Um, and that might even be just a certain synth patch that just has a certain sound to it or um, a certain riff or a certain melody that comes in that you could almost sing along like finder nine toes that's a really good example of an instrumental hook yeah absolutely it's interesting actually going and seeing um uh presets live a couple of times and it, it, yeah interesting listening back to that and going how many people got to the point where they were singing along synth lines they were singing yeah. along to like those core synth lines that they were playing live and that kind of thing which is old cool. school presets was the best yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's, it's just sort of like, it feels like electronic pub rock to a degree, a lot of that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I saw them live as well at um, that one in Newcastle, was it? I can't even remember what it was called. I played there as well. <laughs> yeah. Wow, too many, too many beers that day. Uh, no, you're 100% right. And I can't remember who I was talking to. Um, we bumped into each other at the airport drinking beers in the Virgin Lounge. And they said that they get sent so many demos, they get sent so many songs and they're like, it's all so good. There's just no hook. And I think that if you can, you know, I mean, I'm not sitting here saying that I've written any big hits or anything, but I'd love to. And I think that that's the thing with the tracks that we release. We do, we do always think like, where's the hook? What's the hook? Yeah. Um, and if it doesn't have a hook, then it might be the B side to an EP, you know? Yeah. And not, not to say that it has to be commercial or it has to be like a poppy record, but it's like, even even the like super cool underground records and and left field stuff has has something going on in it that you're like oh that's super cool or that's super different. Amazing. Um, you got any like cheap plugins that you might recommend? Anything under a hundred bucks? Everyone's on a budget at the moment. What would be your like favorite? Uh... Uh, oh, okay. So there's a bunch of great things. So there's a um, Frontier, which is like a free uh, limiter. That's really awesome. Yep. Uh, I'll post a bunch of links actually. I actually use the yeah. Ulean, Ulean loudness meter as well, a heap. Yeah. Um, I think just, I, I've got, they're free, aren't they? Yeah, it's free as well, that one. Um, yeah. I've been getting a bunch of Max for Live stuff recently as well. Let me just have a look what else I like. So you need the full version of Ableton for Max for Live, do you? Or? Yeah, yeah, you need Sweet. The, the um, Convolution Reverb is what we've been using heaps of, which Casper. So good. Yeah, I don't, like he just basically explained what convolution is and how it works, and that's what acoustic audio use, which Klaus explained in another thing, yep. another Zoom, and convolution is like recording the sound and then using that. I don't still yep. don't really understand it, but <laughs> well, the coolest thing is is the convolution reverb in live has these um, impulse responses, so these recordings of um, some classic reverb units, including the like the Bricasti Bricasti Seven, which is like this like nineties reverb or something i think and it's like four thousand dollars for a physical unit um and it's just got these recordings of it ready to go but you can also find a bunch of great um there's called impulse responses that people have recorded so there's other 
hardware reverb units that you can just get these impulse responses and drop them into convolution in in live um that are super cool i've been recently playing around with um like spring reverbs on a bunch of stuff i hadn't really used them much before Has anyone else been using spring reverbs on records yeah uh it's an old technique i think they used to use spring on guitars uh, yeah yeah absolutely I, I, I trialed it on some earlier vocals of mine um it was interesting but yeah you, you can you can get away with that sound it's a bit rocky yeah uh, yeah different kind of tone it's cool it depends on what you're after there's no you know yeah it sounds super you. cool on um on synths and stuff as well like um on more sparse kind of stuff i think uh, just as a guess a, a bunch of the soul wax stuff uses spring reverbs on yeah on it does because it's very old school kind of nostalgic sound and yeah that, that, that was sort of like when rock i guess transitioning to house music you know like the last yeah years or so so yeah man it's funny you say that i've been loving playing around with the spring stuff and it's just so accessible like yeah all these reverbs they all do the i'm gonna have a massive argument that someone's gonna fucking yell at me but they all do the same bloody thing like <laughs> there's different types you got your spring yeah, you yeah. plates and whatever you know whether it's an ableton i use ableton plugins basically yeah for most of my stuff uh all ableton unless it's a specific limiter like a pro l or whatever but yeah the reverbs are pretty tight within ableton yeah, amazing. So what you're saying is like you could spend quite a lot of money on a reverb and you're probably just going to get a very similar thing if you just use a cheaper one? Depends on what you're after, right? Like, you know, the lexicon is like a classic sounding yeah. reverb and you may not, it may be a bit easier to dial in a sound using that lexicon because you know what you're after. That, that reverb is specifically a bit longer and a bit more lush in that sense or whatever. But yeah, it might need a bit more work uh yeah you can always get there but what do they say have fewer tools but use them well or something yeah right. is that the you're talking about the 480 lexicon oh i've lost you there harry oh oops, sorry yeah just hold down space when i'm on the talk uh i think so yeah it, it's <laughs> yeah it's, 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 like it's a, interesting you say that because i went and found um someone had done a bunch of impulse responses from a 480 and saved them. So you can actually just load them into convolution reverb in live. Oh, really? And oh, just, wow, nice. it, it's every, every single, it goes from just the stock presets that were, that were in that unit. And then you can tweak them with the convolution reverb, but yeah, there's, they're all, they're all up there. The, yeah. You just search for 480, 480L or whatever it is. Um, I think easier, something like impulse that. responses. And they're all they're all up there for free. Someone's gone and recorded them and put them in. Mate, the, great tip. The cool thing with the convolution reverb is you could you could throw a. I only just worked this out the other day. You can just throw a drum loop into it. Any other sample, it doesn't actually have to be a um, an impulse response. And then you can get some weird sound design stuff happening where the sound's being affected by the by a drum loop instead. Oh, it sounds so weird. I'm gonna get onto that like. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff it's cool it just stuff. It inspires you a bit to get a bit wonky you know like come on all of us will admit some of the the best ideas have come out of happy accidents like yeah you're just throwing stuff in and out and you're like holy shit like all right i actually don't know how to produce i just just jump on and <laughs> <laughs> just throw shit around yeah, yeah. actually it, yeah. just throwing random samples in and making them in key and just chopping them up sometimes you know with actually not even a clear goal and <laughs> just having a crack yeah, does work for sure a hundred percent uh, the other stuff I've been using plugs wise, uh, I've got a few little waves things that I use if I'm doing vocals, um, sound toys, uh, little altar boys kind of fun. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I've always that's been the best like, tool for like a low octave vocal, all the stuff you were hearing a few years ago where it was all low octave and so clean was all people onto little altar boy before we got on it. Yeah. Zoo. I like the ro the robot one as well, and you can put it in the key, and you can layer that sort of just one note kind of vocodery uh, with yep. with a vocal as well. That can be really cool. I've seen what's people that, use that one, Chris. Is, you is put you put robot on with uh, little alter boy, and then you change the note with the the thing on the left. Yeah, and it just basically oh yeah, Foreman. got you. Note. Kind of like that All Stars Smash Mouth when that's all one note, but <laughs> <it's> all, yeah. <laughs> but uh, robot-y. Um, it's cool. cool. It can be cool to layer. Uh, I, I personally have the whole sound toys bundle and I think everything in there is just like so good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the plate reverb in that's pretty cool too, but I'm, I'm also still quite happy with the convolution reverb in terms of there's some great plate reverbs in that as well. hundred percent. So you've got a couple yeah, of free ones there as well. Chuck us, yeah. Chuck us a couple in, in a, um, 
in a little link into the group if you, if you want. And um, I think yeah, sure. my favorite um, plugin, because I know there are a couple of those ones you mentioned for free, and I, I've been using Hawkeye, SPL Hawkeye, which Casper put on mm. onto me. It's uh, you chuck at the end of your master chain, and it's amazing. Um, I remember with our chat with Ivan Goff, um, we were chatting about people and their different mixing and mastering techniques. And a lot of people were talking and he was talking about, I can't remember the exact um, website, but I was talking about um, just using like mixing with just the left monitor on and just mixing with, with the right monitor on. And um, so let me, let me see if I can, I'll get it up. But basically you can just press left on it and it just, just plays the left monitor and you press right and just press the right monitor and you oh, can yeah. press center. Yes. You can press center and you can press stereo and it shows you the laughs and it's just got the whole meter. It's got, and it's, it's, I think it's quite, quite cheap as well. I'll chuck a link for that one as well, but that's pretty much something that we, cause rather than getting like four or five different plugins, we've just got this one that, that kind of does everything. Um, so that, that could be handy. I think like to save a little yeah, bit money cat. overall. The blue cat frequency analyzer is a good free option for just a just a basic frequency analyzer. I use that a lot yeah. um, during doing comparisons against other mix downs. So I'll go and do a mix. I'll often have a couple of references. Um, typically, I'll try and find a reference for the mix down that's in the in the same key. So yep. it's like the bass is hitting in the same in the same frequencies, um, and then I will toggle between the reference track and my track and look at the frequency responses. And after looking at plenty of records, there's, there's a sort of fairly uniform shape. You set up, set it up, blue cat, set it up on averaging. Um, so it's sort of taking a snapshot over time. And after a while you go, okay, cool. There's a pretty uniform shape as to what a well-balanced record sounds like. And that really helps in terms of being able to, yeah, balance it for other other is that something you do just at the mixing mastering stage or do you always have a reference track kind of when you're making a record? So I'll have a typically a reference now. I was originally using references for like sound design side of things. Um, but now it's just for either for arrangement and I'll have two tracks that are always set up in my template as references. Um, and yeah, typically for arrangement, and then also then for the mix down side of things. So I'll take those two references and push them down by minus six dB. And that's usually a pretty good spot for where my mixes end up. There's sort of a fair conspar comparison. Um, so yeah, and then, and then trying to get something that's in the same key. So at least I know that the, the, the sub is hitting in the same spot because you could have something that's like, yeah, 20, 30, 40 Hertz difference of where that sub area is hitting yeah and it's just it's just hard to compare like there's some great records that you hear a bunch of patrick topping stuff you hear and it's like it's really like really chest punchy and it's not at all low and subby and then you go and listen to like an yeah. fire record um and he's like maximized all his low 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 end in the sort of 40 hertz kind of range um and you just can't yeah. compare them you couldn't compare them mix wise they're both completely different um and that's so a different to, key yeah, different key and then different sound design on top of that as well. Um, and trying to work out, yeah, where where your track sits compared to um, to something else. So yeah, you use a reference for mix down. And I've set up a couple of like hot hot keys in live. So if I hit one, it shows it plays reference one. If I hit two, it plays reference two. Um, if oh, I hit nice. it, it toggles back to my my track. Uh, and then I've got like a low pass. Uh, I just use the, rather than like low pass in EQ8, I use um, just solo the low band in multiband compressor um, and have that on the master. And then I've got that set up on the tilled key, the key next to the one on the keyboard. Um, yeah. I'll hit that and that will give me a low pass. Sort of like turning off my nice. top speakers and just running through the sub. Yeah. And that way I can, I can actually, in terms of a mix down, actually being able to hear that my kick is hitting as loud as their kick in the subs area or my bass is. So you'll listen to area. just say 300 under. Um, 120, 120 below is what. Oh, wow. Are, right? Yeah. And you could probably yeah, get. Right. Yeah. I've, I've heard of people like switching their top monitors if they've got a sub and just listening to what the subs doing. Um, but I've just got that set up. Just, to use that just have your sub pack vibrating. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. That'll work. Just unplug your headphones. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's been really helpful. Cause at least, cause you could have a track that feels just as loud, 
but then it's just not the subs not hitting in the same spot. Or hitting just to throw this out there in terms of key, um, I remember seeing this on an old Swedish House Mafia sort of in a studio thing. Uh, between F and B flat, if you're in a key that's like, you know, F up to B flat, so you know, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, whatever, those, those are where you tend to get like a lot of the low sub because if you look at a frequency chart, F is, I think, 49 hertz. Yeah. And, or 45, that I think, 44. Uh, and so when you get up to B flat, I'd guess it'd be like in the 80s or something. So that's when you start losing that, that sub. So a lot of it, here that's we are. That's why all the melody songs with the same key. What did I say? 120. I was, Samsonite was way off. There we are, 120. That's wow. why all the Melbourne bounce tunes were all in the same key, so that bass note hit right. <laughs> yeah, man. It. A, lot yeah. Of, a lot of Avicii tracks were in like the C minors and stuff. They, they didn't need a lot of sub, and they didn't want them to because they wanted to trans, translate on radio. It's yeah. funny you got that, Mark. My desktop, my screen, yeah. like desktop thing is just the freak, frequency chart. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's like the whole way across. <laughs> yeah. Straight to and the that, reference, you know. That's exactly it. So say, say if, if you have to write a song in a certain key, and so I've, I've got the lower, the lower octave and then the slightly upper octave as well. So you go, okay, yeah. I've got to write a song in C. You're either writing it at 32 and then it's not translating on anything or, it's, or you've yeah. got to hit your sub at 65. Yeah, look at that. Look yeah. at this, everyone. F is a 43, so say 44 hertz. And then B flat, which is A sharp, is 58 hertz. So between 44 and 58 hertz is where you're getting that thick sub. Like, yeah. You get a bit higher, the bass gets a bit thinner and a bit lower, you're not going to really feel that impact. So it's kind of interesting. And I only le started learning music theory. Like I didn't know where F was on a piano four years ago, but going through Berkeley, you learn. It's And anyone can learn. Like I'm living proof. This is a really interesting thing to look at and kind of understand. If you're not sure, just next time you're at your keyboard, on the bass notes, play between, put up a synth and play between F and A sharp and then go beyond, a bit above, a bit below and just... Suss it out. It's good. For anyone that doesn't know their music theory, try and find A sharp for me. <laughs> <laughs> in um, some in some keys, that's actually F. <laughs> but there you go. Music <laughs> oh, there's so much you can go through. I've had my mind been blown by um, who's his name? Jacob Jacob Collier. Oh yeah, great YouTube channel. His level of music theory is ridiculous. He writes songs. He's been working along in a key, and he actually shifts a key change to a key that's between two other keys. Oh, so sick. So it feels, it feels <laughs> sharp, but it yeah. gives a different, it, a different feeling to it that you're not oh, used to. I love shit like that. I mean, even if you're putting like an eyes, oh, great plug in isotope vinyl, like that's kind of what it's doing. It's oscillating yeah. between semitones. Yeah. Gone that's the sort of, um, so that's sort of a, um, like a Mac DeMarco kind of vibe. Like a, yeah, like a, you can do eight, that with, um, there's quite a few plugins that do that as well. RC Retro Color is another one that does that. I don't know if it, that's a, one more chuck in the chat. That's yeah. got quite a cool lot of little. Um, I made um, that Abbey Road Abbey Road vinyl. Oh, you made, made it? Yeah, yeah, right. I made one that um, uses the LFO in live in um, in Max for Live, and it uses the delay. If you ever notice on the delay, now it's got a, a, a pitch button. We used to be able yep. to right click on the delay and change it to repitch as opposed to like uh, current yep. or shuffle or something. And then if you adjusted the, the delay time, it would go re, 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 like almost like a record yep. going back and forth. If you then map that to an LFO, just so it's changing by a couple of milliseconds, you then get that, that frequency, like the pitching in and out slightly and sort of like having stuff in key. If everything's really tight and perfectly in key, um, then everything needs to be. If everything's yeah. moving a little bit, then it can all work. Everything's sort of shifting just a little bit and sort of... If you, you want know, to give it a bit like, of flavour to some of your instruments, it's like, what was that Disclosure song? Um, that one that I'm like, no, this is out of key and everyone's like, it's just flavour. Right, I can't yeah, remember yeah. that, that disco that. remake and like, it's basically just like floating right in and out of key. Yeah. And I'm like, I can't stand this. This is like not in key. And everyone's like, oh, no, it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been happening for oh, years. It's played on radio. Like, it's a huge record. <laughs> all, the, all the 90s house records and you listen to the vocalists and you're like, oh, is that, is that quite right? But even <laughs> stuff like, I was at Man Van Helden's You Don't Even Know Me apparently isn't, it's between keys because by the time they repitched the sample and set the BPM, it's between keys and the vocalist just had to sing between the Dwayne two Harden. keys. Well, yeah. well, think about it. They were yeah. recording stuff on tape back then, and the tape was getting kind of passed around. And I mean, yeah. even on the ends of that, that's pretty interesting, actually. To think about. Yeah, that you can actually repitch in Ableton. So if you throw a sample in there, um, you can warp it, and instead of picking Complex Pro, 
whatever, you change the tempo and you hit re-pitch and it will give you that vinyl effect as if you put a record on on a turntable and sped it up because basically, yeah, you're, you're going, you're tuning a track, basically. You're going up and in between keys. Um, yeah. And then what you, if you do find that you have a track that is not in key, you can, you can do an up and down with the sense and you can push it into key. Yeah. So that's another good, good technique. And I actually, it's funny, a lot of samples that I use even on Splice and all that sort of stuff, um, or whatever you use sample, you throw a tuner on there and you're like, this isn't, this isn't in completely in key. So you need to actually do, do the, um, yeah. Get do the, there, do, do the, the send it to Ramon and ask him what's going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, beautiful. Oh, awesome. Awesome, man. I don't know how good my internet is, but let me show you this, this Hawkeye real quickly. This is what it looks like. This is great for your mixing and mastering. It's good to tell a couple of stuff And then on the left here, see so you can do solo left, solo right, solo mid, solo side. You can do band pass and all sorts of stuff. So this is one I definitely recommend. It's also got your yeah, outlust and all that sort of stuff there. So check that one out, guys. I'll, I'll chuck that into the... Uh... How do I stop sharing? There we go. I shouldn't have that. That's a really good one. Super cool. It's very cheap. It's like 50 bucks or something, I think. So it's on special. Someone said Hawkeye is amazing. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so that's got quite a few different meters in there. Um, anyone else got any questions for now? Anyone at all? We've pretty much answered every question you could want to know about music. So I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> there is no stone unturned. <laughs> it's been good. I'm, uh, I'm awesome. super well, I'm impressed with sure the turnout. Can... This is great. Yeah, this is fantastic, uh, guys. Let's get a quick selfie. Um, thanks for joining us. We're going to do... I've actually got another one of these on Thursday night with Arlo. Tuesday morning, which uh, might be a bit early for people, but I'll, I'll, put, I'll put the feelers out there. I think it's like 9 a.m. Um, with Mike Warner from Playlist, uh, Work Hard, Playlist Hard. And he's got a few really good YouTube videos online, which you can check out already if you want to get a bit of preparation, maybe some questions to ask. And a podcast him. as well. And a podcast. Um, and he's... Brisbane based or he's in uh, LA now or something, but he's, he's from Brisbane yeah, originally. Yeah, he used to be in Brizzy, yeah. Part of Date Night and um, they, they frequented at Prohibition as well, right? Correct, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'll leave something for the interview. Um, and then Arlo as well, Thursday night. And that's going to be more about release strategies. Obviously, Arlo works with Zalon um, and Noise Hive and he's going to just tell us a bit more about all that, all that sort of release strategies and that spreadsheet and what we can do to maximize our releases. Awesome. If there's Fantastic. no more questions, we've got one something from the chat. Oh, thank you. Awesome. No worries. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mike. That was absolutely amazing. Um, I really appreciate your time. All of those links and everything we've chatted about, we'll chuck in the description. And uh, anyone up, up your way can come and join your group. <laughs> come say hey. Yep. Come say good day. Thanks so much for having us, man. Good job no with all the stuff you've been doing. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Cheers, guys. Thanks so Thank much. You, Enjoy. Cheers. Have a good one, guys. See you. Hey guys, thanks for making it to the end of the video. Make sure you do hit subscribe and turn the notifications on so you're going to get notified every time we upload a video. We're doing a minimum of two a week, sometimes three, covering all bases in the industry from mental health, production tips, interviewing DJs. We're going to go deep, 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 covering all bases, get you all the information you need. Hopefully some of it is useful and there's not too much of me talking shit. <laughs>